your gateway to crypto. Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I'm Udayan Mukherjee. My guest on the show today is a young man with what you would call good connections. Uh, his father is the founder of India's most iconic technology services company. His brother-in-law is the British Prime Minister and his mother is a best-selling author and a philanthropist. Uh, but he himself is a budding entrepreneur who's trying to rehaul the way performance in the white-collar world is measured and improved. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Rohan Narayan Murthy on the Business Today show. Rohan, great to have you on the show and good to see you. Thank you, then. Um, great to be here as well. Well, the Murthy surname must be a heavy one to carry around. I mean, it, it would not sit easily on many people's shoulders. Uh, I mean, does it bother you or do you see it as a privilege? Uh, or, uh, uh, I mean, how is it? No, I mean, carrying neither. It around? Uh, there's nothing to really make peace with. I'm just very grateful for the chances of fate and for, for what life has to offer. Sure, even so, I mean, it must be irritating sometimes to be constantly referred to or called or known as Narayan Murthy's son. Well, it is a fact that I'm his son, uh, but uh, I'd hope that over time the work that I do uh, or I have done uh, at least serves sufficient purpose uh, so that people at least uh, refer to me by anything but uh, so-and-so's son or grandson or brother or sister, etc. and so on. So, Well, now you're in the corporate world with uh, Sirocco, but uh, looking at your background, Rohan, um, I mean, the kind of academic background you have, the excellence in research that you brought to the table, it almost seems to me that you're a bit of a misfit. I mean, you actually would have been more comfortable in the world of academia but, and not so much in the corporate sphere. Is that an unfair assessment? No, that is not an unfair assessment. In fact, um, in my own family, we have had for a few generations uh, a significant fraction actually being teachers or professors more recently, my, including my mother's siblings, my grandparents. My, my father's father, for example, was a, was a mathematics teacher um, and so on and so forth. So in, if somebody were to ask me what is our family business, our family business is academia. Uh, in that sense, my father is an aberration uh, to that. Um, uh, and so ever since I've been young, my hero has been Richard Feynman. I read his book when I was in sixth standard in school, and I always wanted to be a professor. Um, my mother's brother is the head of astrophysics. Uh, he's a professor of astronomy um, at Caltech. And, and so he's been somebody I've wanted to emulate. Um, and I've been on that trajectory for a long time. But at some point, I felt... I wanted to build things that people would use, and perhaps that is harder to achieve in the academic realm. And, um, and so that's why I chose to ultimately leave. But at even earlier in your career, I mean, uh, in your academic career perhaps, was it an option going towards physics or technology, or was it always a conscious choice that you had to go the technology way? No, I mean, there's no such thing uh, as to I've had to do technology and so on. I guess this is, I mean, it's not uncommon, right? I guess in in families where people play sports and so on, uh, the, the next generation plays sports. So in that sense, in my family, there have been a lot of people who have done science, technology, and so on. So I've naturally been exposed to it as part of the environment when growing up. So it's something that I was fortunate to be able to, to, to take up. Um, and so it wasn't based on any set of expectations. In fact, if anything, I would think my parents would have hoped that I would have remained an academic and would have been more excited if I had remained an academic. Well, that's interesting, Rohan. I mean, uh, I was going to ask you whether you ever thought that your father would be disappointed if you did not turn out to be a technology entrepreneur after what he had achieved. You're saying the opposite is true. They would probably have been happier to see you uh, teaching at an Ivy League college. Oh, for sure, without doubt. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I think his unfulfilled ambition for his own life was he had been admitted to a PhD program in computer science and then his father passed away and so he had to get a job to send money to his family so his sisters could get married and so therefore in some sense I achieved that part of his, his hope or desire 
And so he thought I would continue to remain in academia and he was very excited. Not to suggest he's disappointed otherwise, but that certainly is something that um, that really mattered for him. Uh, in fact, his joke was, he would tell me saying, you know, when I finished my PhD, I was contemplating applying for a second PhD program in, in philosophy, not even in computer mm -hmm. science. And I asked my parents, and it was a serious thought as to what they thought about me doing that. And he said, look, you can get a business card saying professional student and what a wonderful way to live life. <laughs> so, so in that sense, I've had tremendous support in my family to study as much as I wanted and for however long and pretty much study anything I wanted to. Mm. Uh, and before we talk about Soroko, I also wanted to ask where this inclination towards the humanities comes from? Because you just said that you might want to do a PhD in philosophy, but your early work is with the Murthy Classic Library. I mean, do you get that from your mother or is it just an intellectual leaning towards the humanities that you have intrinsically? No, uh, great question. Actually, I get it almost certainly from my mother. Um, in another life, or perhaps even in this life itself, my mother would make as good a historian as she would be a computer scientist herself. Um, so I've grown up with a very heavy influence from her on the appreciation for literature, for humanities, and so on, uh, for history, um, among other things. And and so it was just a sort of a, a very natural inclination I've had for a long time. And And certainly I had the privilege of being able to study in American institutions where they encourage such um, such pursuits where you can be a computer scientist, but it doesn't deter you from studying history or philosophy or sociology or whatever else. And I guess I just made the most most of that opportunity to learn as much as I could about pretty much anything that came my way. Uh, did it ever uh, cross your mind that since you never needed to lift a finger or you don't need to lift a finger to earn any money in your life with your endowment with Invosys shares, uh, that you would just uh, spend your money in the pursuit of uh, in uh, things to do with the humanities and not to do with the business world? No, maybe not to that extent. Um, uh, I think there is a, a deeper desire to do something, you know, as I say, some mehnat and, and not to live a life only of pleasure seeking, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, and, and so on. So I, I don't think I ever considered some of these other options. Okay, let's talk about the mehnat then. Uh, what, where does the word Soroko come from? What does it mean? You know, it's actually, it doesn't really mean much. Um, it is, uh, it was a, it was a, a former name of our company, or, or rather it was an older, it was an abbreviation for an older name that we no longer use. And then we just thought, you know, it sounds nice. It sounds like a misspelling of Sirocco, the gentle Mediterranean breeze. And so we just kept the name. We didn't really think much about the name. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't really stand oh, for anything. Now you disappoint me, sir, Rohan. I mean, knowing your backdrop, I, I'm, I was quite hoping that you would tell me that there is some Greek, Greek etymological root for that word, which and, and I would be enlightened by that. But you're saying nothing, at, no, nothing as elevated as that. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I wish I had a grand story to tell. I don't. It is, uh, it, no, it's uh, rather plain. No, but your pursuit is quite grand because, uh, you know, for the last many decades, we've seen so many large American corporations, manufacturing corporations, trying to tell us that this is how we are going to create efficiencies on the shop floor in the factories. And in, in a sense, from looking at, from what I read about Soroko, you're trying to do that in the field of uh, technology services or in the digital domain, the equivalent of what a Toyota could be doing on the shop floor. Uh, is that off the mark or how else would you describe Soroko to a layperson? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say it slightly differently maybe. So um, it is true, first of all, historically that when it's come to manufacturing or blue collar work, there's been a very detailed disciplined science for understanding it, for improving it, for measuring it and so on. But there isn't an equivalent for office work or white collar work. Now that's beyond technology services. I mean, if you're in a bank or insurance company or pretty much any job where you use a piece of software to do your work. And that's by the way, most of us, in fact, this very, very interview is happening through software, right? Even this in some sense uh, does not have a more detailed or rigorous science for understanding or improving it. But even within that, um, what we basically attempt to do is when you think about work, and when I say work, I'm only referring to office work or white collar work. 
when you think of work, there are two ways of looking at work. One is what we all do individually. So what do you then do every single day? What do I, Rohan, do every single day? And we have a set of variables about our work that we control. You know, what applications we spend time on and so on and so forth. But then there's this other part, which we don't control, the kind of work that we do, how the work needs to be done, uh, the kind of processes we need to follow, the kind of applications that we encounter, the inefficiency of these applications or the technology and so on. So these are all decisions that management typically take and individual employees don't take. And so what we recognize is that if you want to bring about a rigorous way of understanding and improving office work, then we should focus on the latter bucket. That is those parts of office work that employees do not have any control over and yet are subjected to. Um, and if you can gather data about this, then management can use this to figure out how they can help their people and their teams uh, be have a better experience at work uh, and the end result being be more productive at work. And this is different from saying, I want to figure out who is doing what and how much time they're spending and why are they why are you taking a one hour bathroom break? That is not what I'm talking about. In fact, I would say that is the erroneous way in which people have tried to improve office work. Instead, we ask, how can we support you, each employee or each team, be more successful by focusing on the environment uh, in which you do your work? Um, and we have attempted to solve this problem by using technology. And historically, people have attempted to solve this problem through consulting or one-on-one -on -one interviews. And instead, we've used technology to solve this problem. So, you know, for people who don't understand so much about technology, uh, let me try, try and ask you to elucidate what you just said through a very simple mechanism of say work from home which has become such a big norm in the last couple of years and here is a management which is trying to figure out uh, whether there are gaps in efficiencies because of the workforce working from home if Soroku were to be brought in and asked to help in this process how would you go about measuring a the efficiency or the inefficiencies of working from home and how would you be able to augment uh, the process of uh, uh, in, uh, inducing more efficiency within the workforce from, from home? Right. So let's, uh, great question. So let's see. So, so when we, the, the first and primary challenge when we all work from home is that the metaphorical hallway is no more, right? So if I'm a manager of a team, I can't really walk down the hall or meet people, see what's bothering them, ailing them, um, and so on. Uh, in fact, it's hard. Um, and so uh, with that gone, the other kind of difficult aspect is more and more work is now digitized, right? We're reading more digital documents and whatever else. So you, you don't have physical documents at home. You're reading everything or you're doing everything through technology. And a consequence of this is the base understanding of how, a, if I'm a manager of a team, and the base understanding of how this team is doing work itself is poor today. In fact, we have an article that we published based on our platform and our data in Harvard Business Review, where we showed that on average in the post-pandemic world, managers cannot account for 60% um, of the patterns of work that exist in their teams. Um, and that means that the baseline understanding itself that a manager has of how his or her own team is working and therefore what should be improved is very poor. So if you don't even understand the baseline, what are you going to improve? Now, this is not to take a ding against managers, nothing against managers. It is inherently hard because people are working remotely and more and more digitization means that you actually have less understanding of how work happens. That's the first part. So now the second part is, okay, so what can you do, right? So our thought process here is by deploying the kind of technology and software that we have built, what managers can begin to understand is, hey, I have a team of 20 or 30 people scattered across, working remotely, working from home. Now, what are common patterns that emerge across this team as they do their work that are sources of friction? So for example, is my technology slowing my team down? If so, what is the data to prove that my technology is slowing my team down? Remember, you have no hallway you can walk down and see these things anymore, right? We're able to answer that question. Okay, and then if my technology is slowing, uh, you know, work down, which parts of my technology, where should I invest to make my technology go faster or to have a more seamless experience for my team, as an example. Or second, is my team 
doing the same bit of work the same way or they're doing very different the same bit of work many different ways so this is a very common pattern that we have seen in a post pandemic world i suspect it existed even prior but it has certainly gotten worse post in the post pandemic world which is for example you go to an insurance company and you ask the manager hey how many different ways are your people resolving your claim and they'll tell you here are five different ways but when you actually go see on the ground people are probably resolving it 30 or 40 different ways now it turns out those different ways may be legitimate maybe some employees needed training maybe their team needed help with documentation or maybe some parts of it are just some legacy pieces of work that have been left behind but you have no real way of discovering these different variances in how work is happening um and that too we are able to answer with the kind of data and information that we gather and we produce and so on and and this is obviously made more challenging in a post pandemic world because you now don't have a real sense of if you wanted to as a manager know are my is my team doing this 100 different ways how do you even figure it out it's very hard unless you go to each person's home and talk to them and even then you probably won't be able to achieve this uh we saw this through technology so here are some um seemingly sort of direct ways in which how the kind of data that we're talking about is able to help managers in a post pandemic world but you know rohan it seems so fundamental what you're just describing that it seems intuitive to think that large technology corporations would have thought about this idea and tried to do something along these lines in the past i mean haven't companies like microsoft or ibm the erstwhile leaders of uh, uh, the technology domain or the technology universe uh, grappled with this problem or tried to solve it maybe in a different way that uh, compared to what sorocco is attempting right so i think the way that the world has largely solved this problem then is they've attempted to take what worked in the blue collar world and they're trying to impose it in the white collar world what i mean by that is in a in the blue collar world right if you go to a factory floor you should you know there's a direct linear color, uh, direct relationship between the time you spend on something and the output that you produce so you can say if i measure how much time you spend on the factory floor i'll have a sense of how much output you produce people have built a lot of software in the last 40 years to measure saying how much time do you spend on something but the key innovation or the big leap that we have made and that's thanks to a lot of the work that i've done during my research days and some of my my own co-founder is a phd from carnegie mellon and a few other folks a company who have done in their careers that we have translated over here is we are saying that in the white collar world you don't have a direct relationship between how much effort or time you spent on an activity and the outcome you produce it doesn't it's not as strong as in the blue collar world that's why you can't just measure time you can't just say oh you spent 5 hours on outlook therefore you sp- you sent lots of emails no that doesn't work instead the big leap that we have made is is to take the same kind of information and to produce a map or a set of sequences that will tell you if i have 50 different people in my team are they doing work one way or are they doing it 500 different ways so we therefore produce these sequences you can sort of think of it like dna sequencing what we have done is we have invented dna sequencing but for office work and it's very powerful because it starts to tell you about variations in how we work and at the end of the day all of what we do in white collar labor all of us myself included can be explained through variations and variances uh, and that is the fundamental key innovation that we have made which at least as far as i know is is the breakthrough um so in that sense it is a new uh, way of thinking of work it's a new software artifact sometimes it's a new category of of enterprise software as well um and so there's a lot of educate education and evangelizing and so on that we explained to many companies that we we are also doing to basically create awareness um we have had we have customers where they have scaled this to you know a few thousand users as well and so on within their organization more than a thousands of users they scaled it to hundreds of teams and that's really important because that's where you know this whole thing becomes very effective um so we are seeing traction we're seeing adoption um and most importantly we're seeing customers realize the power of this data right on this very call then we are generating this digital footprint of this data by interacting with software how can your organization use this data to figure out how they can make your life easier right that's the way they need to be thinking about your work as an example right and that's the lens we're trying to get everyone to appreciate um and we you know if and and just to give you kind of um, an analogy on facebook right the average user at least some published stats um the average user does about five interactions a day they 
you know, comment on something, like something, and so on. If you take the top six social media sites, Twitter, etc., and so on, and assuming a person uses all six social media sites every day, the most generous sense, they will do 40 interactions. You, you, you tweet something, you like some video, and so on and so forth. But each day, when each one of us office workers go to work, we are generating 2,800 interactions per person per day. That means each one of us generates 70 times more data in the office when we do our work compared to the top six social media sites on the planet. Now, that is absolutely staggering. 70 times more information. And think how much the world, the kinds of business models, the kinds of companies, the kinds of industries that have been created over the last 20 years, just from these 40 interactions per user per day. And that, to me, is a tremendously exciting, it's a meaningful, you know, to your earlier points of the humanities, it's not technology for the sake of technology. It's technology to change how we live, think, work, Work is a big part of our identity. It's part of our big sense of purpose, our dignity. How do we bring empathy to work uh, with the end goal of being more productive, obviously. Um, and that to me is what I, you know, if, if I'm fortunate enough, I'd love to do for the rest of my life. It seems like something meaningful to do and to give purpose and meaning to a lot of people. Um, and so hopefully that answers your question. It does. But I do want to ask a little bit about your parents uh, because, you know, I used to know your dad quite quite well back in the day and I wonder what kind of an influence he has been uh, in your life and your mother as well. I mean, who's a well-regarded author and very successful person in her own right. I mean, who between the two, whose influence has been greater in your life, you would say? Um, you know, when I was younger, certainly my father. Uh, my father is a very strong personality. Then I know you and he know each other well. He's an extremely strong personality, um, and so he. There's a lot of his, um, you know, things like discipline, rigor, hard work, um, core set of ideas and principles, and idealism to live by. I think these are all things I have either consciously or subconsciously absorbed from my father. Um, but um, la later, as I crossed my thirties, I've realized that there are so many other aspects and of my life that I've either imbibe or I choose to imbibe more of from my mother. Her eternal sense of optimism, her incredible ability to reinvent herself, um, uh, and uh, and her ability to always find a problem, to uh, find a solution, sorry, to almost any problem, and to do it with joy and positivity. Um, and, and so these are things I have, you know, more recently, maybe in the last 10 years or so, learned to appreciate and I wish to learn more of and be more like. Time for a break on the show, but we shall return with Rohan Murthy, founder and chief technology officer of Sirocco, in just a minute. Not only Alia Bhatt and Karthik Aryan, in fact, 2022 seems to be Varandhavan's year too, as after Jug Jug Jio, his latest release, Peria, which also stars Kriti Sanan, Abhishek Banerjee and Deepak Dobriyal in pivotal roles, is off to a decent start at the box office. So much so that it has done better than most of the post-pandemic Bollywood releases. According to reports, Peria has collected over 7 crore rupees on its opening day, while on the second day, it raked in over 9.50 crore rupees bringing the first two-day total box office collection to 17 crore. The film may have had an average start, but Varun's performance in the film has been lauded by fans and critics alike. In fact, in an exclusive conversation with India today, Varun mentioned that the transformation process for Bhairia was challenging and how he felt trained out during the shoot. Bhairia has been directed by Amar Kaushik and produced by Dinesh Vijan. The director-producer duo has also left the scope for a possible crossover between Sri and Bhairia. The horror comedy film, meanwhile, is also facing a stiff competition with Ajay Devgan's star Drishyam 2, which released in common.
Welcome back. You're watching the Business Today show and I've been in conversation with Rohan Murthy, founder and CTO of technology startup Sorocco. Well, I have to ask you about your brother-in-law briefly as well, uh, Rohan, because it's not always that one asks about somebody in the family who is the prime minister of a different country. But I mean, I, how, how did you take it, the news when it came? And uh, are you and your sister very proud of it? I'm sure you are. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, we're all very proud of both my brother-in-law and my sister and uh, of them together as a team. and. And I think more than anything um, is, I think we just wish for him to do whatever best that he can for the people of his country um, and to succeed in that mission. Um, you know, as you know, we are not a family that understands politics all that well, or we've not been in politics. And so he's breaking new ground in, in so many regards uh, as, you know, in an extended sense. And so we wish him well. Your parents must be proud too. Yeah, I, uh, they most certainly are, and and uh, you know, uh, and they also. Uh, it is it is uh, when we all met Rishi before they got married. I think he carries in him a same sort of sense of idealism. Um, that is, there's a somebody was once asking me in your family, what is the most common trait? And I think the most common trait in our family every family has different traits, uh, is idealism. My father has a very strong sense of idealism in his own life, my mother in her own life, my sister in her own life, and and certainly Rishi in his own life. And so he talked about his sense of idealism and purpose and how he wants to do good for his country. Uh, this is a long time ago, you know, even when they were students uh, and when we met and so on. So it's uh, great to see as an opportunity to, in some sense, fulfill that idealism and try and do something good for his people. So. And we hope he gets to do that fairly well. Well, I hear that ideal, idealism in your voice too, Rohan. And I'm sure you'll make your parents very proud. You must have already, but I'm sure you'll make them even prouder uh, in the years to come. I mean, it's, it's very nice to hear the energy and enthusiasm in your voice about the Soroko idea. And I wish you great success with it uh, in, in the time to come. Thank you very much for your time today. And it was a great pleasure chatting with you. No, thank you then. And thank you for your time as well.